Deb and I, many, many years ago, had the opportunity to live in Germany for four and a half years. Uh, what we would do, a lot of soldiers will go to, to Germany and they'll stay on post, they'll stay in housing, they'll never get out. We tried at least once, one weekend out of the month, we would go and just travel all over uh, as far as we could. We did these day trips and we would go to these little villages, little towns, and it was always very unique. You go into these little towns, they're very, very, very old, and without fail, right in kind of in the middle of town would be the church building. Now, from the outside of the church building was kind of unique. They were very plain. Often they were just tan with brown, you know, in these, in these small churches, in these small communities. And so you would look at it and go like, it's very Spartan looking. It's very sparse. It's just like plain and nondescript. And it's really kind of hard to even know anything. But we always tried to make a point of going in, much like uh, Salem, their doors were always unlocked too. And so we would go in, and as soon as you walked in, I mean, you were hit with this unbelievable beauty. Murals on the ceiling, gilded statues, in, I mean, gold gilded statues. I mean, unbelievably ornate. And some of them, it was so big, instead of, in, in, instead of looking up at the mural like this, they would put mirrors on the floor so you could look at the mirror to see this, the mural on the ceiling. I mean, everywhere you went, where there was these statues and former priests were buried in the walls. And I mean, it was just unbelievably beautiful. But without fail, when we would go in these little churches that seemed plain on the outside, but glorious on the inside, they were, they were, there was this sense of emptiness, this sense of cold. And I don't mean the temperature. Okay, I don't mean because it, it was cold because of the marble floors, or it, it just it just seemed so empty. It was like there was no heart. It was just like there. And, and guys, I I wouldn't do. I'm not saying that, or, or, or even then would I would would I say that about being critical. But it would always come across that the fire was gone. The fire and the passion and the love was, was just empty. And again, I wasn't doing it to be critical of them, but I used it and it made me wonder, how, how do we as churches keep that from happening to us? You can have the most beautiful building in the world. But absent from the love of Christ being in the center of that room, the center of that church, it's just empty. And it made me stop and think, and it always has me remember this, the, the, the phrase, there but by the grace of God go I. The potential always exists. We're going to look at some other churches over the next seven weeks. These churches had some issues. They were churches not at all unlike churches today. They were real churches, real people, in a real society. These weren't analogy churches. They, these were churches that actually existed. Most of them had something really good going on, but most of them also had this really huge, glaring problem that ultimately is going to cause them a significant amount of damage. And just like we use those churches in Germany, we're not going to look at these seven churches to be critical of them. That is certainly not the point. We're not going to look back at them and say, well, we would never do that. Instead, we're going to look at these churches and look at what happened, what went wrong. What's going to happen if they didn't change and follow the advice of Jesus? How do we apply those lessons so that we never have to have Jesus say about us what he says about these churches? So we are going to look at the seven churches in the book of Revelation and use those as a mirror for us. Again, written to seven churches. There is actually a repeated command over and over and again to these seven churches. 
And it's this. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Guys, he's talking to us. How many of you have at least one ear? He's saying, you need to listen. Listen to what I'm talking about. Not, it's not just to them. It's to you. It's to us today. If you have your Bible, look in Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. We have a slide for that. We have a slide for Revelation 2, verses 1 through 7. <clears throat> it was actually in, in, in 53, the year 53 AD, that Paul had visited the church in Ephesus. And that's about 43 years before this letter was sent. That the Re book of Revelation came into being, that John had the dream, and he had this revelation before these warnings were sent to the church in Ephesus. Look at verses 1 through 7. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to test those who call themselves apostles and they are not, and you found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. Man, wouldn't we love to have that said about us? Isn't that a great compliment? Yeah, but then there's the but. But I have this against you. You have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place. Unless you repent. Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, the word angel, when it says to the, to the angel at the church in Ephesus, he's not talking about, when we know angel means messenger, right? Everybody know the word angel just means messenger. He's not writing to an angel angel that was serving as a messenger. The word to the angel means to the messenger at the church in Ephesus. So you know who he's talking to? The pastor. And he said, you need to tell the pastor, I got an issue. Trust me, no pastor wants to hear that Jesus has an issue with us. He says, write to the pastor of the church what I'm about to tell you. Now, we don't know, you know, most of us don't know a lot about Ephesus. Ephesus was a huge major city in Asia Minor. Uh, it was a seaport, actually, and, ha and it held within it something called the Temple of Artemis. The Temple of Artemis was the largest building in ancient times, and it was actually at one time considered one of the seven wonders of the world. It was that big and that magnificent. There was an open-air theater in Ephesus that would accommodate, ready for this, 25,000 people. We don't always think about the magnitude and, and the grand scale in that day. 25,000 spectators. They used it for gla gladiator combat but they also used it for drama and theater. The church in Ephesus was so effective in its beginning that the silversmiths who were building idols for the temple of Artemis and for the people who worshiped there, the, the silversmiths started a riot because the church was so effective in combating false doctrine that the silversmiths were losing business hand over fist. And they didn't like it. But that's how effective the church was at the beginning. Is that They were showing the world that this is the love of Jesus and this is the truth and the way and the life. And the temple of Artemis is not. It, it, the scripture here talks about the one who holds the seven stars. That's Jesus. 
Now, talk about the seven stars. We're talking about the seven, the seven churches. And he says, I hold them in my hand. What does that tell us? That tells us, listen, Jesus is in full control over his church. He has a grip over the church, or at least what it's supposed to be. The angel there, the messenger of the church, was not in charge. But Jesus was supposed to be in charge. He is the one that has the authority to oversee the functioning of the church. He is the groom, and the church is the bride. He is the head, and we are the body. No matter what committee we serve on, no matter what in place we serve in the church, no matter what, how many deacons we have, the authority is still Jesus Christ. We operate under His tutelage, not ours. Now, he says, because of that, you need to listen to what I'm about to tell you. He starts out by pointing the good things they are involved in. And if you read that first part, he's like, man, you guys are active. You've got a lot of things going on. Your ministry calendar is full. You're having a hard time getting volunteers to serve. And I know we don't have that problem here, right? This was a serving church. Man, were they. They were busy. He says, toil. Toil. You know what that word means? He means literally you are serving to the point of exhaustion. Anybody want to testify to that? He says, man, you guys, are, you guys work hard. It, it's, he's like, there's no doubt your weekly calendar is full. He's like, you are a sacrificing church. You toil to the point of exhaustion. From the outside, it would appear that they had all these great programs that many today would say that those programs mark what is a truly a healthy church. Boy, and this church knew their doctrine. Man, did they ever. And they stuck to it. They could spot a, they could spot a false teacher from a mile away. They could smell them coming. They studied, they learned, and when this church was assaulted by people who claimed to be prophets, the church stood their ground. They weren't going to waver one inch. In fact, evildoers, false prophets, they kicked them out. They said, hit the bricks. You're not a part of us. With all that activity and, and all that watching out and the, the, living in, in, in the onslaught of a pagan town, man, they held tough. They persevered. Man, they, they just they stood and they persevered. And if you were looking to, if you if you and I were to look at that church today, we would say, now there's a church that's really doing some good in the community. We would say, those guys, that's a solid church right there. Some of us would say, well, that's a church I want to be a part of. But even with all of that good stuff, all the good things the church in Ephesus was doing, Jesus said, I have a very serious problem with you. I have a very, very serious problem with you. And the thing is, they're not even aware of it. They're not even aware that something has gone terribly wrong. And Jesus says in verse 4, I have this against you. You have left your first love. I mean, think about it, guys. 35 years earlier, Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. That's the book of Ephesians. And he never stopped giving thanks to them because of their faith in Christ. And their love for the saints. 35 years earlier, Paul was praising this church. Man, you people love Jesus. Man, you people love people. I, I am so proud of you guys. This is amazing. And now 35 years later, Jesus says, I got an issue with you. You left your first love. 
They had grown cold-hearted. I want you to pay attention about something. Jesus did not say you have forgotten your first love. He did not say you have lost your first love as though they had misplaced it. It clearly says you have left your first love. In some instances, that word left in that verse is actually used to mean you have divorced yourself from it. You have divorced your first love. And their first love had been for Jesus and for people. They didn't lose it. It wasn't like they misplaced it. He says, you have completely divorced yourself from what your heart should be. This very serving, very separated, sacrificing church suffered from heart trouble. They had abandoned, intentionally abandoned, Their first love. They were no longer passionate about the love of Jesus Christ. I mean, can you not hear what's going through their mind as this letter is read to them? They're like, but Jesus, come on, man. Look at all this great stuff we're doing. Look at all this great stuff that we're doing for you. But hadn't Jesus warned earlier? You will say, did I not prophesy in your name? And he says, depart from me. I don't know who you are. It's like, but we're doing all this amazing stuff, Jesus. I mean, we got sound doctrine. We're serving each other. Why are you knocking us? In the midst of doing all those wonderful things, they had lost the most important thing that was supposed to be at the core of Everything that drove them. You know, I've seen it happen in couples. One of my first couples I ever had the opportunity to counsel uh, as a minister of counseling at First Baptist had been married almost 30 years. You may have been married 30 years or more. 30 years, and they were sitting across from me, and you knew it was going to be a bad night. Because there was a big couch that we met in, in this room. They, sit, they would sit on the couch, and she sat on one end, and he sat on the other end. And that's when I knew my work was cut out for me. And they came in there almost 30 years. And they were going to get a divorce. And what it boiled down to is they just didn't care anymore. They didn't love each other. And hadn't for a long, long time. That marriage began to fade. The marriage the church has began to fade. And the very thing that brought them together had been left. Not lost. Left. Divorced. And God says, listen, here's the problem. If you do that, if you continue with that instead of this, going back to your first love, this is what's going to happen. Guys, that's the fairness of God. God just doesn't come to you and say, this is a problem in your life. Figure it out. He says, this is the problem you have. Here's the fix. That's the fairness of our God. And here Jesus points out a very deadly problem for the church, but then tells them what they need to do to stop it from happening. In verse 5, he says, you've got to remember. You have to remember where this started. He said, you started the very heart of who you were because you just loved Jesus. That was your passion. That was what drove you. That was the flame. That was the thing that just made your heart jump and skip a beat. How many of you remember when you first really fell head over heels in love with that person. We got some marriages, got some struggles. Uh, 
Y'all need to tell. You remember that? Man, I do. Oh, I do. I, I, I sometimes got off of work way before Deb would get off work. She was working at a place called Service Merchandise. Anybody remember Service Merchandise? Yeah, you're old. <laughs> she worked at Service Merchandise. And I would drive to where she worked. She worked uh, in Service Merchandise behind the jewelry counter. Should have been my first dangerous clue. Because a cubic zirconium was never going to cut it. <laughs> But I would go there, I'd get off work, I would go there and I would hang around uh, the, the jewelry counter while she was working. So much so that if, the, if it had been the day, they would arrest me for stalking. Okay, and I would do that and, and so her boss would come by and I would start asking questions about rings. Now I didn't have any money, I wouldn't go buy a ring. Uh, but I had to make it look like I was there to buy something. About the third or fourth time he would come by, he, he, and he learned that I was the boyfriend, he would say, you, you need to tell him he has to go. And so Deb would say, I'm sorry, you have to go. My boss is upset. And like a little puppy, my head would drop, and I would walk out like this. But I had learned in a short period of time what I would do to combat that. So when he kicked me out before he called the cops, I had always had like a card or a rose or something in my car. And I would go find her car and put a rose under the wiper blade or a car. I know, right. Oh, I'm a good, I was a good boyfriend. No, really, I was. Um, and that's what I did. Listen, let me tell you how much I remember that when we first fell in love. This is no joke. I have the exact T-shirt I was wearing 39 years ago when I first met her. In my closet today, is it not? It's a little snug. The dry cleaner shrunk it. <laughs> but I still have it. And it was cool. Because every time I see that Georgia Bulldog T-shirt, I'm not a fan anymore. Um, it, I just think back to what it felt like, you know? And the links that I would go to to convey my love to her. If I worked late, she would come to the airport and she would sit in our little waiting room. And we would talk. My office closed at 10 o'clock and we would sometimes sit there 11, 12, 1. Because it didn't matter. Nothing else mattered. We were just together. Do you remember what it's like when you first fell in love with Jesus? And I said this the other night to the group on Sunday nights. I said, I love baby Christians. Oh, I so they are so excited. They are so full of love and passion. And I mean, they, they will try their best to save a tree. And I don't mean by not cutting it down. I mean, they will have an argument with the tree and introduce Jesus to that tree. They will talk to a wall if they can, to share Jesus and their love for Jesus and what Jesus, they, you know, there's that person that is so excited, they can't wait to go to the next church. So when worship service is over, they're excited for the next one. At that, at that point in time where you were a new Christian, you were excited, you got to pray. Not had to pray. But you got to pray. You were so in love with Jesus, you were even excited about giving your tithe. That was, did you hear that? It got real quiet. But like, I don't love him that much anymore. Um, because you knew you were giving it to God, right? And, and then what happened? But what happened? We mature, quote unquote, which is just another way of saying you're getting older. But we don't spiritually mature, or we think we have. How many of you remember the story of Mary and Martha? She's sitting at his feet. Her sister complains. What are you doing? He, she should be working. He's like, no, 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 no. She's doing the better thing. I won't be around here long. She's doing the better thing. Just sitting at my feet and talking. So Jesus tells the church in Ephesus, look, you need to repent. You need to turn around and come back to that very thing, that first love. He's like, you need to change your attitude as well as your affections. 
You're more, you are more in love with the doctrine than you are me. You are, you are more in love with doing stuff than you are me. He says, it's bigger. He's like, you don't need to repent. I'm going to give you the opportunity to repent. You have the chance. Given the opportunity, you can heed the warning now and start fresh. He says, you just need to go back and repeat the things that fired that love and passion. Just go back and do those things again. Go back to stalking your spouse at work. Text them little love notes. Call them on the phone. Write something on the bathroom mirror before they get up, before you leave. Y'all remember doing stuff like that? When you were still in the honeymoon phase? Jesus says, go back and do those things that, does, that, that talk about the love you had for me. Which was what? You, you worship and you liked it. You celebrated. You gave. You wanted to tell everybody in town about me. How many of you, when you first really, really, really fell in love, wanted to tell everybody about that person you were in love with? Come on, couples, raise your hand. We got work to do. They just go back and do that. You want to keep your marriage fresh? Go back to doing that kind of stuff. He says, tell the church, you need to remain fresh and at the heart of who you are. You need to go back and do that stuff. He's like, yeah, keep doing the good stuff you're doing. They're like, I don't have a problem with that. But do it because, not because it's right. Do it but because you love Jesus. Just repeat what you did at the beginning. He's like, you don't need a new program. You just need to rekindle the love. Just go back to what I told you, he says. Go back to love God and love your neighbor. Go back to that. Do that. Because he says, listen, if you don't, he says, if you don't, the results are going to be horrible. And it's hard to think that Jesus would have something against his own church. But the truth of the matter is, when a church deviates from what Jesus has commanded, when they have left their love, he will not tolerate it. And he says, I will take the blessings away from that church. The lampstand is basically his light that sits at the center of the church. That lampstand, it, 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 it's, it's the light. We're, the church is like a moon. The church has no light of its own like the moon. It merely reflects the sun. The church merely reflects the sun. And the church is to be the light of the world. It isn't about our light. It's about his light. The reason so many churches today have reached a plateau, plateau or have begun to a fast decline is that God has removed his hand from that church. Seriously. You think, well, he wouldn't do that. Oh, yes, he would. That's what he told the church in Ephesus. They've made it, the church has made it about finding a magic bullet or some new program or that unicorn pastor who can make all the bad go away. What they don't realize is the Holy Spirit's left the building. Why? Because they left what it was all about. In verse 6, now by the way, just we'll touch on what it means to the Nicolaitans. There's not a whole lot known. There's very little information about the, the cult of the Nicolaitans. What they do know is that the Nicolaitans were basic, basically an amalgamation of every idea you come up with. They would like this from one denomination or one, one church. They would like this from this group and this from this group, and they had to put it all together. He's like, I don't like that either. At least you don't like them either, and we're good with that. But to be honest, if you were in the church in Ephesus and got to verse 6, you probably wouldn't have heard it. You know why? I'm still stuck on the comment about I have this against you. I'm like, oh, well, I don't care about the Nicolaitans. I don't want to talk about that. 
If you were a true believer, you would be stuck on that. Jesus has what? Jesus has something against me? I don't care about the Nicolaitans anymore. They're, you're nothing, they're nothing but a blip on the radar screen. I would be more torn up about what Jesus had just said about me. In verse 7, the definition of the one who overcomes is actually in 1 John 5, 5. It says, who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. By the way, has anybody ever visited Ephesus? Yeah, it's in, the ru- it's in ruins, isn't it? Nothing left of it. If you go there and look for the church, you'll find barely a foundation. The church in Ephesus no longer exists. The city died around it, and it died with it. Now, again, we're not going to look at these guys to be critical. We're going to use them as a mirror. And find out, what is this telling you? Why is this so important to the church today? I would dare say that every person in this room, and probably everybody watching on the live stream, wants God to bless Salem Baptist Church. Amen? Everybody raise your hands, please. I'm a little uncomfortable if you don't. Um, We want to see God work in this body and continue to grow and reach people. And so today we learn from their mistake. We have to always remember that Jesus is in complete control of the church and the church submits to him. But we submit out of love. We don't tell God what he gets to do. He tells us because we love him, he tells us, and we just do it. And it's like this. A few years back, uh, there was a guy named Christian Herter, uh, was the governor of Massachusetts, and he was running for a second term. And man, he was campaigning hard, had this busy morning of chasing down votes. He had not had lunch. He gets at a, a church barbecue to continue his campaigning. It was later in the afternoon when he arrived, and he was starving. So he's moving down the serving line with everybody else. He held his plate out to the woman serving chicken because you know it's a real church. They serve chicken. She puts one piece of chicken on his plate and turned to the next person. And the governor said, excuse me, do you mind if I have another piece of chicken? The lady said, sorry, I'm supposed to give one piece of chicken to each person. And he said, but I'm starving. The woman said, Sorry, one to a customer. He normally heard her what they said was an a unassuming, kind of modest guy, but he decided in that day he was going to throw his weight around. Ma'am, do you know who I am? I am the governor of this state. She said, you know who I am? I'm the lady in charge of the chicken. Move on. But guys, it's fun. But the reality, and that's a true story, by the way. And, but the reality is that sometimes the church is that way. We tell God. We want to throw our spiritual weight around. And we become so self-impressed. And we think we run ourselves. And we think we can throw our spiritual weight around and dictate to God what he's going to do. And God says, no, 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 no. Jesus is the lampstand. He's the light in the middle. You go to that light, not your own. And he says, remember, listen, you cannot have sound doctrine and lack love. You know what we call those folks? The folks that have sound doctrine but lack love? You know what they're called? Legalists. But neither can you have love without having sound doctrine. You know what we call those? If you have love but no doctrine, you know what we call that? A community club. Truth by itself, quite quite frankly, be offensive. Sometimes it can be poisonous. Spoken without love, it turns people away from the gospel. But when truth and love are combined in a church, it is able to persevere and bring out the beauty of Jesus. And return to the things that you were called to do. Don't just change your mind. Change your life. To change one, one's mind and heart and, and purpose and let it be done in love. 
There are a lot of churches that have old sins and old hurts and old resentments that exist even today that need to get turned over to God. The church may still exist, but God's not in the equation. Any church, every church, even our church, if there are old hurts and old bitterness or anything in the past, we need to clean out what doesn't show our love for Jesus and love for others. Maybe in our own life, right? Man, you're good about coming to church. You read the Bible. You tithe 0.5% to the church. They didn't catch that one. You know, you go to a Bible study, but you've lost the love relationship. Maybe you need to say, you know what, God, I'm sorry. I got so busy thinking I was doing good, I kind of left you out of the equation. The question we have to ask is, will we remember when the love was real? I mean, it was passionate. I'm talking about for Jesus. <laughs> When it was untainted by cynicism or the world. When it meant something. Well, we remember when grace was still amazing. You ever, ever listen to that song when you, you listen to a church singing Amazing Grace? You can tell if, they're still, if they still think it's amazing or not just by the way they sing it. We remember that. Do you remember how grateful you were for the forgiveness of sins? Do you remember how that in that moment nothing else mattered but Jesus? Guys, this morning, God wants you and I to go back and remember that moment in time and return to it. The question is, as individuals, as a church, will we repent? Have we gotten so busy that we've missed the greater good? Will we return to what that great thing is? That is the love, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. In Matthew 22, he said, that is the first, and that is the greatest commandment. You can fulfill every other commandment, but you can't miss this one. If you miss this one, you missed it. Because he says it's the first and it's the greatest. If you don't obey anything else, obey that one. Because you know what's going to happen if you do? Everything else falls into place. We actually are going to celebrate communion today. <laughs> greatest act of love known to mankind. Jesus said no greater love than, this, that, than a man has than this. That he laid out his life for his brother. And he said, I call you today, brother. This is the greatest act of love known to mankind. I think sometimes, not everybody, but it happens. We take communion and we don't realize that we may have left our first love. This symbolizes everything that love is. In a moment, we will share in communion. And we may take a minute or two longer in between. Because what I would love to have you do, as you hold that bread, as you hold that cup, is to remember, this is what it's all about. This is it. Nothing else matters but this love. I want to give you time. It's written that anyone who partakes of this needs to do so with a, very seriously. They need to consider. I'm not going to ask you to necessarily come down here and repent and, and pray at the altar. But what I am going to do is ask you to hold that bread and just consider to ask ourselves this question 
Have I lost my first love? Man, wouldn't it be great to be in awe and be excited again and on fire and passionate and exciting? How many of us could use a little more excitement and passion in our lives? Don't answer that question. Would just just take a moment, just bow our heads, use this time as a time of silent reflection. Would you bow with me? Father, forgive us when we get caught up in things, when we get caught up in stuff, where we allow that first love for you to take a back seat. And God, in this moment, knowing that this is your body, symbolizing being broken for us. And in fact, you told us, do this in remembrance. Help us to always remember you first loved us so much that you gave your only begotten son that whoever believed in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. In Jesus' name, amen. We celebrate those who join the service or put themselves in harm's way who are prepared to sacrifice their life on our behalf. We call them what? Heroes. Heroes. This is the greatest hero you'll ever meet in your life. Is the one who laid his life down for you. Who lived a sinless life. Was tormented. Hung on a cross. Put in a tomb. And three days later walked out alive. And he tells us. This part we do in remembrance, but we also point to the day where our love is met face to face. God, thank you that your love never fades, never grows weary. Thank you that your love never stops loving, never stops desiring that true love relationship with each one of us. God, help us to remember that. But to point to the future, to know that we will always have that until the day that we meet our love face to face. In Jesus' name, amen. Some of you might have never truly experienced that genuine love relationship with God. You can through Jesus.